Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for calling this hearing and the previous ones that you have. And I want to thank my friend from Idaho for letting me uh, go ahead of him despite his uh, seniority. And uh, General Caldwell, I want to thank you for your service uh, to the country. Uh, and then I want to get into the chronology. It seems to me that on September the 3rd, 2011, an article that negatively portrayed the hospital uh, and our uh, involvement with it appeared in the Wall Street Journal. Now, Chairman Chaffetz, uh, I missed part of your opening statement. Would you be gracious enough to perhaps share just a couple of the more salient examples from that article about abuse and neglect at the hospital? J just a couple, if you have them. I apologize. I was in another committee hearing when I missed it. There were a series of very graphic photos and very specific allegations of patient neglect. And the other thing I would uh, highlight here um, is that on September 3rd, General, you sent uh, to General Allen an email that, about the Wall Street Journal article and said, quote, did not contain any of the items concerns we had previously discussed. Rather, it focused on uh, NMH and Afghan leadership. It, you also stated it is clear that the author, Maria, was provided emails and internal briefings and pictures by someone within the command, which confirmed that we have all suspected from earlier discussions. It was obviously clear to you that there was a lot of patient neglect going on. This goes back into September 3rd, and so yet you testified by concern, as the general just uh, said, that he had no emails, no information uh, that this was happening. So, Chairman, if the chronology, if my chronology is correct, we have a, a, a negative article on September the 3rd, 2011. We have a letter from our colleague, Congressman Kaufman, on September the 7th, 2011. We have an article in the Army Times on September the 11th, uh, September the 7th, 2011. And then we have a new policy promulgated, a, new, a, a memorandum that, that sets forth a new policy. Chairman Chaffetz, uh, not surprisingly, on September the 12th, 2011. So in the course of less than 10 days, we have a negative story, a congressional inquiry, an article in the Army Times, and then we have a new policy. So, General Caldwell, my question to you with specific reference to this policy, one of the goals of the policy is to promote a positive image of coalition forces. And this memo is specific with respect to persons assigned or attached to command Surgeon Medical Training Advisory Group. I, I'm, wouldn't you be more interested in an accurate image being portrayed as opposed to a positive one? I mean, if the reality is bad, then why is it so important nine days after a negative story to stop the photographs? Congressman, at the time, I, I was not aware of this memo. I have been made aware of it since. I do know that last week uh, this committee did get deposition from the command surgeon as to the chronology and events and activities starting around the, I think, believe it was the April 2011 time frame when this, this memo was Would you agree started. with me it is more important to show a, a realistic, accurate portrayal of what is happening as opposed to just wanting to focus on the positive? I mean, we would all like to live life only highlighting the positive, but, but that's, that's, not, I mean, that's not our job on this committee. We're, we're interested in what was really happening. So why nine days after a negative article do we get this memo restricting what can be disclosed and, 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 and telling folks that we want to assert a positive image? Again, Congressman, I didn't uh, review the memo. I wasn't associated when that was released uh, while I was in command there. I was, I but my command surgeon did start putting that memo together back in the April time frame, and it took many months before it was completed because of the reviews that were done all the way up to the CENTCOM headquarters to ensure the proper wording and uh, clarification as to what was being sought after. And the intent behind the memo, as I now understand it, uh, and again, she gave deposition to this committee last week in pretty uh, exhausting detail, as I understand, uh, explaining the, everything about this memo. But was that her goal was to ensure that we weren't violating any privacy 
rights of individuals. And, General, I agree. That is a worthwhile goal. It just makes me wonder why it took so long to promulgate a memo to protect that goal. Uh, you see, my point is the chronology. Negative story, let's issue a memo that makes sure this never happens again. But again uh, you're talking memo, about patient yeah. protection. Patient protection was just as important an issue the day that we showed up at that hospital. It didn't just become important in September of 2011. It's the timing of it. Yeah. That, that you don't have to be cynical or skeptical to question the timing, the chronology of this, I don't think, do you? I, I believe, again, um, uh, Congressman, that this memo started being drafted in April, and it took about four months. There was absolutely no connection, as I understand she said in her disposition, between when she finally got it back approved for release uh, by both the ISAF headquarters and the CINCOM headquarters who had to review it and approve it, both through legal channels and uh, up there before the, this could be released, and when it got released. There, as I understand from her, that there was absolutely no correlation between the two. But, I but when you see a, a negative article in a widely read publication, you have a letter from a member of Congress, you have an article in the Army Times, and within the course of less than 10 days, you have a memo telling people to do things differently and promote a positive image, you could see why we might be skeptical of that chronology. Right. Right. I think the intent of her memo was telling people that let's respect the right of each Afghan citizen. It's a sovereign nation you're operating in. If you have photos that we think we need to record and provide, let's do it through official channels. There's no, no objection to doing photos, but if we are, they need to be done in an official manner, properly controlled through official channels. And I agree with all that. It just makes me wonder why the memo wasn't promulgated a lot sooner. Those are very important concerns, so important that you would want that memo out maybe the day after the thought crossed your mind that we don't want, we want to protect patient security. I, I just find the chronology to be well, and uh, curious. Did, within 30 days of her coming in and assuming her job as the command surgeon, she identified this as an issue that had not yet been addressed. And she Who was her on, predecessor? Was Colonel Geller. He did not think patient security was uh, as significant an issue as she did? I, I can't speak to this thought well, process. Well, I can just tell you, she identified this within 30 days of her taking over as the command surgeon as an area that had not yet been addressed by somebody, and she took it on to make sure that it was properly addressed. Uh, with the gentleman, uh, with sure. General, General, why was it the policy uh, that the photos should be destroyed? Why destroy evidence? Why not turn this over to the Inspector General? I, I think, and, and again, as I've after the fact, I have read this memo, as I understand the memo, it says but General, if you, you have photos, you, turn them over to official authorities. It doesn't, it said if there is a photo that's, um, that needs to be retained, it needs to be retained in official. No, it doesn't. Um, it, says, it says unofficial personal photos or video or audio recordings of patients or health care events taken by personnel subject to this policy, which already exists, will be destroyed or deleted. Right. I believe it is either the paragraph right before or after that one, Chairman, that is, is clarifying that if you have personal photos that need to be retained in an official manner, to please do so. We'll, we'll dispute that. Uh, I think it's, it's in black and white. We'll look at this. And I guess one of the questions we're well over our time here is, how is it that it takes four months to issue a memo, and, you, and you're the commander, and you didn't even see it? You say you, you had no idea that this went out. I've never read it. I didn't know about it. How, how, can, how can that be, that it goes out on your letterhead, and you say you don't even know about it? Chairman, there's, there's a lot of things in the command that I would expect my subordinates to do the proper and right thing and if they are doing the proper and right thing, they don't have to show me everything. If they believe it is something that is contrary to what we have done before, is it change or something, I would hope they would bring it to my attention. But she had this fully within her authority as the command surgeon, and I would have expected her. And, and Colonel Fossil did not have the command or the authority to ask the Inspector General to come in and help him out? No, he, he would have absolutely have had that authority. You pulled it back. Our command was making a request to request outside assistance on October 28th. And when they did, and we had not finished the necessary and proper coordination, we had not notified the Minister of Defense, and we had not told the President of Afghanistan. Again, I go back. You asked me why my statement, Chairman, was written as it was, because if you don't understand the tenets on which we were operating under, 
the idea that we team with our Afghan counterparts, that we have transparency with them, that we are not going to try to do something, that we are not going to look them in the face and say, you have got a corruption problem. I had been telling the Minister of Defense and his key officials, but we had not yet gone to the President of Afghanistan and also told him. And so we asked them to make sure that he was told before we made that. But it did not stop any of the ongoing coordination that occurred between the, the Department of Defense and our team. In fact, on the 4th of November. I guess I would disagree with that, General. I, I would disagree with that. All right. But we will continue to explore. As we have gone way over time, I thank the gentleman from South Carolina. I thank the chairman and I thank the gentleman from Utah for his indulgence. Uh, be echoed through the uniformed services in the State Department, lest anyone have a different view. Uh, I have historically viewed uh, military people uh, to be so apolitical that, that it is only in the deep dark of, of late uh, in a codel that someone will say, you know, I am actually a Republican. And that is about it, uh, and to the great extent, uh, the nonpolitical appointees of the State Department. Uh, I would like to take an opportunity, even though it is not the subject of this hearing, Ambassador, on, on behalf of myself and I am sure every member of Congress to express our condolences for the loss of your colleague. Uh, I knew Chris uh, working that, that region, and uh, it will be a great loss to the State Department. And uh, I, I think that, that we all feel from the dais. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Um. I think we now recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Mr. Chairman, I just yield back. I'd like to, if you could yield to me for a second, I'd like to, consistent with where we were going and what we're doing, uh, I'd like to show. There's two clips, um, and I'd like you, without you know, uh, filtering for myself, I'd like to show you those clips. Hopefully, the audio will be adequate uh, from our previous hearing, and then have you respond uh, to each of these. Recognize myself. Uh, I want to pick up Colonel uh, Fossil on where we were before. You had made a recommendation, a formal recommendation, to bring in um, help, support, IG. What what happened when you made that request? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A as I uh, talked about previously uh, and touched on it, the the request that I made to Ambassador Moorefield. Uh, went forward, and then I was told by Lieutenant General Caldwell uh, and staff to uh, retract it. And I did that by telephone and later by email. What, what specifically did he say to you, and what was his justification for not doing this? Uh, prior to that, uh, there, there was a meeting. Um, in fact, there were two meetings. And I, I don't think we, we talked about those, but um, the first meeting involved uh, myself, uh, Steve Anderson, uh, Scholar Geller, um, Marion Amrine, uh, General Patton, Lieutenant General Caldwell, and uh, that's all I can recall right now. But that meeting is where General Caldwell came in, and he was visibly upset that we had. Uh, made the DODIG request for, uh, and at that time, uh, an investigation or assistance visit, an inquiry, due to the uh, circumstances in the hospital. Why would he be upset about that? Uh, what did he specifically say? After, after that meeting, uh, there was a shorter meeting in his office, and that was between me, uh, obviously Lieutenant General Caldwell, Colonel Bush, his chief of staff, and Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brett Sylvia, his military aide. And he was visibly upset again because I, I don't think that, uh, and, and this is my conjecture, that Dr. Kim and him had a chance to talk about uh, this situation in the hospital. Okay? Um, but his first response to me uh, was, how could we do this or make this request? Uh, with elections coming, and then he made the really, uh, again, uh, shocking comment that he calls me Bill. But what does that mean? Well, I, I took it as that uh, he was referring to the President of the United States. General Caldwell, your response? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. There's about three things there. One is and I will try to walk through them as he made uh, uh, different uh, statements there. 
One was that uh, he was uh, told to retract um, the request for the IG uh, assistance that we're requesting. And in fact, I think in his own words, uh, he writes, you know, I'd like to quote, because this is important to know what he said at that time. He perhaps has forgotten, but I'd like to be very clear. He said, I spoke with Lieutenant General Cole this evening about the email below. That's the request for the DOD IG assistance uh, visits. And he says, Lieutenant General Cole will respectfully request not to move on this request for assistance until he briefs General Petraeus on this issue. He agrees with the substance of this email. So I just, it, it, the wording that he used was not the wording that he um, used that night in, in going back and explaining to Ambassador Moorfield what we were trying to do was set the conditions, and so we were asking him to hold on that until we had finished all the necessary and critical coordination. The second one, when he said he was, uh, he had not talked to Dr. Kim yet, that is an accurate statement, Dr. Kim and I had not talked at that point in time. So I was not aware of the earlier afternoon meeting uh, that several of them had had with uh, himself. I, I don't recall the, uh, the, other, the first of the meetings he refers to there, but I do recall the second one when he was in my office. And, I, and, and as he says, I was uh, uh, upset. And, and I can tell you, I was very concerned. I was upset, and the reason I was is for three reasons. And the first one is we had not yet set the conditions uh, to team with our partners. So I hadn't informed General Petraeus, my, my superior, that we were going to bring an outside agency in and seek assistance, which would eventually, the only way this would succeed, the reason we were bringing this outside team in was to seek the removal of General Yaftali. And so if we didn't bring General Petraeus in, <laughs> The, the ultimate goal of bringing this team was, was, was to remove Yaftali uh, and expose this corruption. And I would need the President of Afghanistan to acknowledge it and not deny it in the end. And so, and again, if, if you look at the events that occurred in the previous few months, there had been some death of Afghan civilians, accusations Americans uh, were doing these things. Uh, there were some very tense relationships between General Petraeus and the uh, President of Afghanistan. So I wanted to make sure General Petraeus was aware that we were going to bring this organization in to help assist us, which, which eventually, the end state being the removal for sure of Yaftali, and then obviously the ability to now start fixing the medical system. I also wanted to include our Afghan partners. I was upset because I had not gone back to General, uh, uh, the Minister of Defense, and told him I'm going to officially do this. He and I, along with General Patton, had been talking to him for some time about the corruption we were seeing. He himself had launched his own internal investigation based on information we had given him, and yet they had not been able to bring it to a point where it would enable them to remove him. So I wanted to make sure he was on board. The second point was, it stated in the email that he wrote that evening uh, back to Ambassador Moorfield that we did not have to have, he said, P4's approval, referring to General Petraeus. We may not have needed General Petraeus's approval. But the ultimate objective of what we are trying to achieve through this would never have occurred without General Betraeus's involvement and, and association with this effort. I, I needed General Betraeus's help. And he was the senior commander. And if nothing else, I had just do courtesy and respect. I owed him to tell him what I was doing as I was doing it. So I was upset that he would say that uh, when he full well know that, again, I go back to my three tenets, the tenet of transparency be transparent with our Afghan counterparts, be transparent with my boss and what I am doing, you know, team with my Afghan partners, one of my tenants. We weren't doing any of that. And then the third point was it contained inaccurate information. He specifically states uh, in that email when he writes it that, um, and again, I, you know, we met with Dr. Kim today and he has briefed General Caldwell on the prospect of this. Uh, DODIG spoke conducting this inspection assessment. Um, Dr. Lieutenant Colonel General Caldwell and Dr. Kim welcome your involvement. Well, that was an inaccurate statement. I had not yet been briefed, and I did not yet know about this. And so we were, in fact, telling the Department of Defense IG's office something that was inaccurate. Wait, what was the date on that again? Again, this is the evening of uh, the October 28th. Wait, did you? But on September, uh, the first week of September, you had a Wall Street Journal article. The, the things that Mr. Gowdy talked about. You telling me you just dismissed that? I mean, you sent it to your commander, Chairman. If I could, I, I, I believe you're referring to 2011, not 2010. 
I, I don't want to correct you. I just, I just no, want no. I, I want you. To, I, I want to get this. I want to have this clarified. Uh, no, I, I think the Wall Street Journal article occurred in right. 2011. In 2000, exactly. Um, this was still in 2010, and so I is so I was upset with my IG because for the sake of just a few hours, I was returned that evening from traveling to one of our training sites inside of Afghanistan, coming back to the headquarters, and everybody knew I would be back that evening. For the sake of a couple hours, you know, we could have waited and brought me in and, and briefed me. And, and my first response would have been, we absolutely need to do this. We have been talking about doing this for months. We have set the conditions with General Petraeus. Let me now write up. In fact, what I do the very next morning, Mr. Chairman, is I send General Petraeus a very detailed uh, note explaining to him that we are going to do this seeking his approval, let him know we want to move forward. And simultaneously, General Patton, and he can talk about it, he pulls the team together and starts all the internal coordination that we are going to do to make sure we are teaming with our Afghan partners and being very transparent with them and how we are going to move forward. Again, if we are going to do this, we want to remove General Yaftali. That was absolutely essential. If he was not removed, anything we, we dealt with down at the lower levels would have been for naught. It would have been a temporary fix and the corruption would have crept right back in. And, General, with, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, granted, I am not in the, in, there in real time dealing with all the other headaches that you have. This is not the only thing that was on your plate. I, granted, I, I understand that. What I think is a disconnect for me, in at least your, your approach there, is that one would exclude the other. It seems to me that bringing in the resources of the Inspector General would add to the case your ability to be more transparent, to understand what was happening in this situation. You knew from the beginning of your command that you didn't have the resources you needed to uncover all the corruption, again, not just at this hospital, but throughout the government. And, and what, is, what is concerning, the reason, and, and again, if we had one colonel express an opinion, of course we would listen to that. When you have three colonels come before us and say this was just absolutely untenable, and we did not get the resources, we did not have the support, we did not move as swiftly as we can, we were not as transparent, that is in part why we are doing this investigation. So with all due respect, I have gone way over my time. General, we will give you ample time to continue to respond, but let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. General, what was the um, time lapse between the time that you asked to retract the email to the Inspector General and the time that it, uh, you sent an email or directive to go ahead and, and invite him in? It was about 12, 12 days, Congressman. Okay. Um, and is there any discernible um, circumstance that changed inalterably because of that 12-day period? Uh, no. The, again, we used that 12 days. During that 12 days, we continued all the uh, coordination with um, the Department of Defense IG. That dialogue and discussion continued not only from my own staff from inside of Afghanistan, uh, but also with my team that was back in the United States. So it, when we said hold, it didn't mean stop working it. We kept working it the entire 12 days. And then, and then with the addition. Department of Defense IG, while simultaneously also doing all the necessary and critical coordination inside of Afghanistan, of which General Patton was doing, uh, with the entire Ministry of Defense.